Welcome to another one of our webinars. Um, hopefully you've been part of these in the past. We have an experienced great group of faculty and business administrators who are helping us as part of the AAN Neurology Academic Initiative. And we've done a number of these and we're pleased to uh, keep them going and trying to provide resources for our academic departments and chairs out there. So we've done a few of these by now and they're all uh, recorded on the AAN uh, webpage and YouTube, sharing best practices during COVID, New York City's response, reactivation of neurology departments for clinical operations, education and training in the post COVID-19 surge. Uh, next slide. We've done one a special one that, that was in response to what was happening with the issues regarding systemic racism and, uh, and, and bias, and that was in July. Uh, and we also did one on financial repercussions for neurology departments, resetting research operations uh, was done in October. All of these are available on AAN.com and the AAN YouTube channel. Uh, and so um, I hope that you've been able to use these and utilize them and share them with other people in your department that you may find uh, some of the um, important facts helpful. Next slide. So today uh, we're focusing on, you know, continuing some of the work, uh, pivoting a little away from COVID-19. We know COVID is still happening everywhere and uh, some of us are dealing with it more than others as we see the surge. But these were uh, programs that we had built into our chairs initiative and the, and the chair summit that was going to happen in March of 2020 that was canceled. And so we have uh, some, some great faculty had worked on some of these and this is one of them and we'll be doing some others coming up in December, January and February. This one is about adapting your department for coding changes. Some of these coding changes as you know have already hit in terms of lessons regarding the long-term EEG codes that have affected us all and preparing for some of the e &M changes that are coming. Next slide. So I have a great panel group of real experts uh, with me today. Uh, we have Dr. Gregory Barkley, who's department chair at Henry Ford Hospital, an expert in EEG. We have Jasmine Barrera, who is an administrator for UC Health San Antonio. We have from the AAN, Amanda Becker, senior director of policy and practice innovation. And also from the AAN, Luana Siccarelli, senior manager for reimbursement and coding. We also have Brad Klein, who is a physician of the Abington Neurological Associates, and he is chair of our um, Medical Economics and Practice Committee, and Pierce Kaur, who is associate professor at the University of Colorado, and then Kathy Seiler, who's a department chair at University Hospitals in Cleveland Medical Center. So we really have a great group of panel members, and um, you can see them all here. I've introduced them, and uh, I think we'll try to get started. So remember, use the Q&A for uh, questions uh, that are coming in. Um, so we're gonna first talk a little bit about EEG. And that's been something that we know has changed. And I'm gonna ask uh, Greg, Greg Barkley, if he could describe some of the changes that have been made regarding EEG billing codes and the impact they've had on clinical revenue for our departments. He's gonna use a couple slides just in the beginning to illustrate it. And then we'll pivot back into more of a discussion format. So Greg. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, these codes started uh, in use in uh, January of this year, and they came about because three years ago, CMS thought that the one code that was used for video EG monitoring 95951 was potentially overvalued. The result was after three years of uh, negotiations and uh, surveys that we have 23 new codes, 10 for the physician services and 13 for the technical services. For the uh, physician services, the codes are now uh, time-based with uh, daily reports for codes that last from two hours to 24 hours and include whether or not video EEG is a part of that. And it includes whether spike and seizures are analyzed so that uh, there's no separate code for that. In addition, this requires a daily report, and if it's a part of a several day uh, session, such as a long-term monitoring of somebody in an ICU or in the epilepsy monitoring unit, on the last day, there is a summary report that's also part of that. On, in contrast, uh, for EEGs where the patient is hooked up in the office and sent out for 
two, three, four more days, there's only a single report done at the end of the visit as a one-time only report. Next slide, please. In contrast, the technical codes uh, have a separate, a single fee for the hookup and a takedown, which is assumed part of that. It's only billed once. And then the codes are all divided by whether or not they're with or without video, and then whether the uh, recording session is not monitored, monitored continuously with four patients or fewer, or whether there's intermittent monitoring for up to 12 patients. So these fees are all a uh, part of that. And uh, the question you might say is, why does this matter if I'm only doing inpatient? Well, it does matter because this gets generated as part of the cost structure of your hospital system. And in an outpatient practice facility that is used in many medical groups, the ambulatory practice groups, which are sort of like the outpatient DRG, are also based upon this. And this is how costs are accumulated and accounted for in a health system. Next slide. So the financial impact of this is potentially quite a bit. So the video EG monitoring that was the old code was valued at 5.99 RBUs and had a total time of 150 minutes to do the study. When our neurologists that participated in the survey took the code for the equivalent of the 24 hour video EG monitoring, they said it only took 80 minutes. And so it's not surprising that since as Kevin Kerber, who is one of the members of the American Academy of Neurology's uh, RUC task force determined in his, a landmark paper, 80% of the code value is how much time it takes to do the code. So we've had a big cut in the codes in a proportionate manner throughout all of these new EEG codes. So uh, one of the things this has resulted in is that because the, there's much more granularity to the technical codes, We've also had to uh, adjust how much, how we've assigned EEG text to watch our, our studies. The bar for continuous monitoring is quite uh, strenuous. And so most places are either doing intermittent monitoring or some places no monitoring at all. The budget impact obviously will vary depending on which financial choices you have made. And then to throw uh, a, two other monkey wrenches into this, in January, when these new fees came about, many of the insurance companies did not have their financial uh, software aligned up or the coding permission. So there was some delay in getting these codes launched in January. And then of course, the pandemic hit in March and April and threw uh, many EG monitoring units uh, into, uh, into a hold status for a long time. So. This uh, code change uh, structure has not really played out to the full extent this year because of all these changes. One thing that has happened is that a lot of uh, medical centers have switched to doing more of the outpatient short EEG codes or switched to the ambulatory monitoring codes as a way to continue services when their inpatient units were in suspension for a while. Oh, great, thanks, Greg. So a lot of changes as you know, and, and if anything, cutbacks. Uh, just when COVID's hitting, we have these reductions in both RBUs and obviously then reimbursement for an EEG service. And so some departments who do a lot more uh, epilepsy monitoring, um, uh, ambulatory or inpatient are impacted by this. Pierce, you know, you know, you're at the University of Colorado. What do you think? How has this had an impact on your department? Any any tips or best practices that you want to share with us? Sure. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sacco. So the impact is obviously profound and for many of you probably the same in your departments. Um, I can't share specific details, but I will say that we've had a couple months pre-COVID to look at the projected impact financially of these reduced codes. Um, and then we've also kind of revisited that kind of in between the two waves that we've experienced recently. And I would say that, you know, with a gross change of about 45% and a decrease when you, it's a complicated calculation because you're going from a relatively singular code to like Dr. Bartley said, several different codes, but it, it roughly for us in a large volume center will amount to about a million dollar revenue loss per year um, uh, when you compare it year over year. So it's a huge financial impact. I think when you think about best tips and, and what I'll say here, talking to um, a host of chairs and practice administrators, 
is the devil is in the details, but I'm going to be brief. So feel free to ask questions later, too, if you have clarifications for me and our institution. But one of the things that's come up is really reevaluating how do we launch these services on the inpatient side, especially when there's continuous or long-term video EEG monitoring. Because you have these restrictions on tech ratios, the technologists that can be live monitoring these continuous EEGs, you really got to think about what, first and foremost, I think, what is your standard of care for how much monitoring do these folks need? Um, we actually kind of benefited from a pretty tight safety protocol to begin with. So we've had a lot of pretty good tech ratios at Colorado pre this ruling, but now that, that it's very specific, it's one to four for continuous monitoring and one to 12 for intermittent every two hour monitoring. So just for example, Dr. Sacco, what you might do is say, well, for our EMU patients whom we've admitted electively and have a high risk, we might do a one to four ratio. If we have eight people in the EMU at a given time, that means two techs with eyes on continuously. You might then say your continuous patients that are not part of the EMU, your critically ill patients, your floor patients, maybe they need intermittent monitoring every two hours, or some places actually only kind of monitor those patients every uh, three times a day. So you, you might sort of say that that will just go unmonitored based on this criteria. Either way, I think you're having a rational approach to that, an engineered approach by working with your neurodiagnostic specialist. If you're a chair who doesn't, like Dr. Barkley has an EEG background. So if you don't have that connection, I urge you during this time of transition to really start working with them closely. So that's a way to possibly cut expenses if you're changing the uh, tech ratio for monitoring? Is that, is that, is that the well, way well, one would, to I, mean, one I, mean, I would love, idealistically, you would start from a patient quality standpoint sure. first. And then when you go to hospital administrators, if it's really a matter of budgeting or sort of wrapping into our DRG or trying to justify the expenditure of another tech, you might then say, well, if I do unmonitored, it's $200 per technical fee per day. If I do intermittent, it's around four, uh, 300. And if I do continuous, it's 600. So you've got to be creative with the math and show them that there might be a reason to do more with more. Great. So there is a quick one a second, Greg. There is a question that came up um, regarding any of you use the Q&A. I can't look at the Q&A in chat also. I see another question in chat. I'll try to deal with them. We will be getting to. But in the uh, Q&A, it was, uh, what about DRGs? Uh, I don't know if Greg or Pierce, have those changed as well with these RVU changes and these code changes? Greg, do you want to handle that? The DRGs uh, have not changed per se, and so okay. the payment structure is the same. Uh, the mm -hmm. DRG uh, process gets reevaluated based upon the hospital cost summaries that are submitted, and so there will be a lag uh, in how that is done. But it turns out that when you take video EEG monitoring and you roll it into all the other patients across the country that are admitted with seizures, with or without comorbidities and complications, that we actually make an infinitesimally small amount of the total bill for right, monitoring. Right, right. So it probably will have no impact. So this is the kind of the professional billing that occurs for those that are monitoring the EEGs uh, in, in inpatients, correct? No, not exactly. So if you're an, uh, so when the physician interprets a study uh, of any sort, no matter where you are, you get the professional split of the, to of the it's the dash 26 modifier right or the technical fee it depends on your practice site so if it's an inpatient it goes under the drgs a single cash payment to the hospital if you're in a medical center doing provider-based billing it goes as an uh, ambulatory uh, process procedure uh, component which is apc and is paid as to the center and if you're in your private office, you, you bill global, a total bill that includes the professional and the technical as one right, single right. fee. Right. So any other differentiations regarding inpatient and outpatient? I like the idea you had said when inpatients kind of were closed down, some of us were able to shift to outpatient, though we had inpatient and outpatient closed down during COVID. Sure. But what about ambulatory and inpatient uh, work with uh, these EEG monitoring? Well, so there's, I would want to add one component to what Pierce said. So one of the things that one might want to consider is if you're covering more than one hospital, then you can use electronic uh, uh, 
to our advantage to put many patients under into one center where you have a collection of techs who are actually monitoring play, people from more than one hospital center, similar to what some of these ambulatory uh, companies had done with uh, the outpatient to EEGs. So that's a way that you can kind of coalesce some of the, your expenses into uh, a single cost center in a more efficient manner. I think that uh, the ambulatory monitoring could continue uh, relatively uh, uh, unch unchanged, but uh, remember the techs are really frontline workers and uh, they spend a lot of time hooking up this equipment and uh, they're face to face with patients and they are really frontline at risk workers. At risk. But just today I told the chairman of internal medicine that we have resumed our uh, spring COVID precautions and we are, the EEGers are deciding which patients need uh, EEGs or not. And we're not going to be doing routine, we're not doing EEGs on metabolic encephalopathy when it's right. a neurologist, the cause is obvious. And we're only going to do it where we think that it might make a difference in terms of seat or something the like that. The neurologist could be in the screening seat. Jasmine, I wanted to turn to you a little bit uh, as a business administrator, these new codes, you know, obviously when new codes come in, the people coding are sometimes new and also the people interpreting as we heard because of COVID-19, the insurance companies get behind. How have you dealt with denials or any other business office operations to help make this transition go a little more smoothly? Thank you, Dr. Sacco. So as we all know, the insurance company, the payers are really looking for any opportunity to deny claims and are very slow to adapt uh, to coding changes. And so with the changes to the video EEGs in this year, um, separating the professional and tech technical components into different sets of codes, um, we had to work with payers. We were um, getting denials for not having the 26 modifier, which wasn't required anymore. And even to this day, now in November, we are still working with some payers who are still denying claims for the lack of the 26 modifier and our revenue cycle team has to appeal and we are getting paid, but it just takes a lot of work. So um, just the lesson is to continue to monitor all of your denials carefully and appeal when you can so that you're not writing things off that should not be written off. Right. And with next year's changes, they're not a new set of codes, but we'll have to continue the same practice of monitoring. I'm sure they'll be asking for more um, uh, information on, on documentation if they feel the level is not appropriate. So just don't and take we your know out. you got to work those denials quickly because the clock ticks and if we don't turn them around fast enough, sometimes then the door is closed. Let's right. also turn to a question here, and we were dealing with this recently. You know, the RVUs have gone down, the reimbursement has gone down, the benchmarks for epilepsy and our epilepsy faculty have not changed because benchmarks lag. Faculty practice solutions uh, are going to be delayed until 2021 to reflect on what happened in 2020. And even our own American Academy of Neurology, Neurology uh, Compensation and Productivity Survey, will be doing that in 2021. But that data for these new benchmarks is, still, are, is going to be delayed. So what are some ideas? You know, your epilepsy person now has reduced his RVU um, you know, output. What are some ideas that you've done? And let's just hear briefly from a few people. Greg, starting with you, what have you done to help manage these uh, benchmarks that are now too high for your epilepsy faculty? So we struggled with this. And in the end, the Henry Ford Medical Group decided with this and COVID and everything else that we were just going to keep everyone whole for 20 21, and that uh, we actually made an across the board 2% increase to all employees of our health system and raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour for our lowest paid employees wow. in recognition of all their sacrifices that everybody made this year to, to stay safe and take care of a lot of sick Great. patients. That's, that's a nice health system. Uh, for us, I tell you, we've created some internal in the department way, and then we're going to use this to go to leadership. And I think the number is 23.5%. And I don't know how we came up with it, but my financial guy did some modeling and he said, let's reduce the, the uh, targets, the metrics by, I'm pretty sure it was around 23%. But other people, Kathy or uh, Pierce, uh, any ideas on the benchmarks? 
We had an adjustment in uh, 2019 uh, that we were coming in in a pretty good state into 2020 and we've suspended 2020, but our benchmarks are around a five year rolling average. That's and nice. so dramatic changes either up or down are a bit diluted and not so um, disruptive. That's a good idea. Yeah, benchmarks over a longer period. Uh, Pierce, any thoughts in Colorado about these benchmarks? Nothing yet to add. I mean, I'm, I'm actually very interested to hear what other people are doing because our process is ongoing. Like many uh, chairs out there, I'm sure, are wondering how to adjust for this. Right. And I think we will have new data. Uh, some will be coming from outside, but fill in your AAN Neurology Compensation and Productivity Survey, which will be out in March. We use that and we give that data back to you to help create benchmarks for your um, epilepsy and other subspecialty uh, faculty members. So Luana, as we end this segment, uh, what can you tell us about what the AAN and other AAN assistants that you can provide to help us through manage these uh, new crises? Sure. So anytime any of our members have a question, they can always email. Uh, we have a shared account practice at aan.com. And that's monitored by health policy, medical economic staff. So coding, practice related questions, they're monitored by staff. Um, you'll get a response within 24 hours. So that's if you have a very specific question. In terms of EEG, we do have a coding EEG, uh, FA, uh, coding FAQ document, excuse me, that's posted online that ran through a number of scenarios with this new code structure. And we'll be sending that out to anybody in the audience. Uh, there are a couple other handouts that I think were, were shipped out in advance. So we're going to pivot now to kind of the middle part of this uh, webinar. The other big thing, some of it I think has occurred already, and some of it's going to be occurring some more, is the e &M coding. You know, our evaluation, our management codes, this has occurred and will be continuing. And there could be some good news here. And this part of, um, of the uh, the uh, webinar is to really talk a little bit about what CMS is up to in 2020 and 2021, uh, even though they haven't released everything yet, some new procedures will be put into place. And we're really trying to figure out, um, is there an overview of what's changed? And Brad is gonna walk us through some background here and also provide us some tips regarding uh, time-based billing. Appreciate that, Ralph, very much. So yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I, I think everyone would agree that 2020 is a year in many respects we really wanna forget. Um, and, and certainly there have been a, a fair number of events that have been not very pleasant, of course, as everyone is, is very well versed. But there are some shining lights in the context of what happened uh, as a result of uh, COVID and such like telemedicine and, and the, you know, uh, the catalyst to this. Um, but there are other things that have been going on behind the scenes as well, such as the ENM coding changes. Um, and this has been a, a work in progress for a long time. I mean, to be truthful that, you know, the revisions occurred last in 1997. So, you know, healthcare has changed a little bit since then. So these were long in coming and, and CMS helped us move this forward. And, and through a lot of advocacy, we prevented uh, a number of different changes that could have really impacted our practices in terms of the collapse of the e &M codes and, and the uh, expected, uh, you know, expansion back to the, the full levels of coding that we, we know and love so much, uh, particularly levels two through five. Um, and so I, I think, and I hope you agree with me by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll see that the agreements between what the American Medical Association CPT panel had come up with and what CMS is supporting and all the other commercial carriers are also supporting, you'll find that this was a very good move uh, for all of us, and particularly those in cognitive care such as ourselves. Um, so we still have the medical decision-making table um, as well as the opportunity for time-based coding, uh, but those two have dramatically changed. And I will caveat that I think this is more of a stepwise process in that these changes will be for established patients and new patients, but it will not apply at this point for console codes outpatients or inpatient work observation, emergency room and stuff like that. So the key thing to keep in mind is that this is for established patients and new patients alone at this point in time. And if you can go to the uh, next slide. Great, thanks. So the first thing I wanna spend some time talking about is, is time-based coding. So as we've been doing for umpteen years, it was that face-to-face -face time. So greater than 50% of this time was spent in counseling coordination of care, um, 
for the sake of our patients. And of course, if you did work ahead of the visit, let's say you did a record review and you didn't hit a certain amount of time uh, and then you saw the patient um, and then you did some additional work afterwards to just complete your notes. Maybe it's eight o'clock at night and you're finishing your note with a glass of red wine, perhaps. Uh, you could of course get paid for any of that. And of course you can't get paid for the red wine despite, but you can get paid for the time that you spend for that particular patient. And what basically came forward was to change that time-based approach from face-to-face -to, -face to the total time. And so as of 12.01 AM, the morning of the patient's visit, through midnight of that evening, you can bill for the time that you spend with your patient, and not just the counseling coordination, the, the history that you get, the examination that you do, but all that stuff that goes on ahead of the visit and after the visit, as long as you're recording that, you can bill for that time through a specific uh, coding that we'll go into. Now, I do want to caveat, though, that as, as it is now, that you can't use your the time that the resident spends or the medical student spends to document time. It has to be your time alone, not your staff time, but your time involved in this process. But I, I think you'll find that it, it does make it easier by the fact that you can now do total time instead of face-to-face -face time. If you can move to the next slide. Great. Thanks. So when we're talking about time-based coding though, as you're well-versed in, there are certain uh, criteria for how much time you need to spend to get a certain level. And that's changed a little bit. So you wanna be conscious of those changes, but I would argue that it's much easier now. And, and frankly, in, in many respects, it's more practical because for new patients, it's very easy. Every 15 minute increments gets you to the next level. And then for new patients, I'm sorry, for established patients, it's every 10 minutes will get you to the next level for coding purposes, up to 60 minutes respectively for a new 40 minutes for an established. And then the key thing to remember is this prolonged service code 99417. Because with this code, if you exceed either of those level five codes by 15 minutes, now you can start billing for that versus beforehand, where you actually had to hit at least 30 minutes in face to face time to uh, allow yourself to bill additional uh, time based uh, approach. Next slide. So and let me interrupt you here. And what about this when we used to say 50% of the uh, visit we dealt with uh, counseling? Is that all now included and just together and you don't have to make that statement? Right. No, now all you need to say is you spend how much time in total time and that's all you need to include. So it makes it much easier as well in that, in that respect. Great. Um, the second thing is from the medical decision making approach, very, very different than what you knew because the amazing thing is you no longer need to include a history or a physical examination to do your um, documentation for the sake of coding and then billing. Don't get me wrong, you still need to, of course, document what's clinically appropriate. You still need to um, uh, think about it from a medical legal standpoint, depending on what you're doing and, and many other re reasons that you might want to document a fair amount of information in, in your notes, but you don't need to include that for the sake of coding and then billing. And that's important to keep in mind. So your ROS, you don't need, your family history, your social history. Again, if it's appropriate clinically, then certainly include that, but otherwise it's not not necessary for that coding and billing component. And the way this breaks down is it's three elements, the number of complexity of problems addressed, the amount of complexity of data that you're reviewing, and then the risk of complications or morbidity and mortality of particular practice management that you're, you're performing. So when we're thinking about problems assessed, we're thinking about, you know, one or more in, in a level four, for instance, one or more chronic illnesses, um, you know, with exacerbations. So if you think about if you're as a headache specialist myself, you're, you've got a patient with chronic migraine with status micronosis. So that would equate to one of the elements needed for level four, um, or maybe you've got two stable medical conditions that you're, you're working through. And that might be, let's say myasthenia gravis and hypertension, but you're not necessarily changing anything in that you're thinking about whether or not there's a need for change, but you don't need to necessarily make any changes. And that would equate to a level four for the sake of that first element. And you only need a second element to get to that level four in terms of coding and thus billing. So when we're looking at data reviewed, for instance, it comes down to three categories. One is uh, test documents, orders, and if you talk to an independent historian like the mother of a child or the spouse of, of someone with Alzheimer's disease, or you're independently interpreting tests, so you're looking at the MRI yourself and you're not billing for the uh, interpretation you do separately, or you're discussing with another care provider, another physician or a qualified healthcare professional. So again, in my world of migraine, for instance, maybe you reviewed a primary care doctor's notes, uh, you reviewed the CMP, and then you felt you needed to order a TSH. 
that would also qualify as the second element for level four. And frankly, you're done at that point in terms of your coding structure that you need to think about to get to that level of four. Um, from the risk standpoint, uh, frankly, for level four, if you're involved in prescription drug management, so patient was evaluated for side effects of topiramate, it's working well enough, they're not having side effects, you choose not to make any changes, but you thought about whether or not there's a value in that. And again, that would have qualified for a level four. So you only need two of those elements to get that level. So just to be clear here, Brad, it's time or the medical decision making, right? Yeah, that's so correct. that's one way. If it's time, how you how do you document the time? So all you need to do is, well, the, the key thing is making sure that you're being accurate. And it's really important to keep in mind that you don't want to abuse the system. Of course, we are being given the flexibility and arguably the trust to ensure that we're doing this fairly. So, you know, if you have a, a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, for instance, you know, documenting that you spend two hours in counseling the patient probably wouldn't be the right thing to do. Um, and certainly you exceed, you know, 24 hours in a day, obviously that might um, raise some concerns. I mean, unless you're Dr. Strange, you know, and you can bend time, it's probably not gonna work very well. So you've gotta be very sensitive to that. Maybe you're gonna need a stopwatch to work off of. Maybe your EMR system is designed such that you can go into the notes and you can track the amount of time that you spend in the notes alone. Uh, and then recognizing if there's anything that you do outside the EMR system and then account for that in summary, otherwise a stopwatch and just being honest about the time and being careful about that. So there is a there is a question that's come in here. So aside from total time spent, do you have to break down the time for all the time billed both prior to and after the visit with any description? Like in the note you write, I spent one hour reviewing the CT scan and prior records and then I spent an hour after the visit counseling or, uh, or how do you, do you have to document these times and spell it out in the note? Yeah, the CPT manual to my recall does not require that type of level of documentation, but I would probably include some nuances to help just support your claim, particularly if an auditor looks at it. Yeah. Um, but I don't believe it's a requirement. Great. Yeah, so there's there's a number of different resources as Luana alluded to before, and it's really important that you know everyone take a look at your convenience as to what we have available at the Academy's website because it does change, it does evolve. Um, so you've got the ENM, uh, you've got CPT, and of course you have the MDM table that was uh, emailed to you uh, recently. Uh, that's also on our website in case you lose it, um, and certainly um, distributing to all your faculty because what you're going to need to do with your faculty now is to figure out you know certain divisions may do it a certain way in terms of uh, you know, they spend a lot of time with their patients. And so maybe time-based approach to management is going to be the best approach for that particular group. For other people, it might be MDM approach and you guys will have to figure that out. There's an additional case studies available online as well. So just make sure that you keep looking at our website because we keep evolving it and particularly for the needs that you guys present. Great. Thank, thank you, Brad, for help bringing us all up to speed on this. You know, we're, with a lot of us, we're dealing with the academic uh, practices out there, medical students, residents, fellows, APPs. There was a question that's come in and Pierce already is trying to answer all the questions. But Pierce, this one is for you. Tell us a little bit about how you now using these time-based codes and knowing what we know, what counts and what doesn't. What are some tips when you're dealing with residents, students, and even APPs? Yeah, I think there's an opportunity to, again, engineer uh, something during this COVID pause into something useful. I think that what's been said is that time-based billing makes a lot of sense for a lot of our neurology providers for ease of use and also sort of honesty. The issue with, um, I'll start with residents because I think we often work with residents and they're very autonomous. We often have them in these clinical teaching models independently seeing the patient, examining them, and then we sort of staff the patient with them. So there's not a lot of face-to-face -face time in a lot of these structures. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to bill on time because if you were, do, were to do that, you might bill five minutes for a pretty complicated patient. So I think the key here is to know that in this scenario, using billing based on medical decision-making or MDM is actually probably the better way to go. So if you're a chair of a department, you've got most of your clinics billing on time. Maybe your schedule, if you've engineered it that way, is based on that. Maybe the way you operate your workflows in your clinic and ambulatory operations is based on that. But when it comes to teaching clinics, you're going to want to pivot into MDM. And so you're going to want to have trainings for teaching faculty and the residents on the appropriate documentation to support that MDM. Mm -hmm. uh, so like uh, Dr. Klein mentioned, the exam and the history is really driven, that content is driven by the, the MDM or complexity of the case. And so making sure your faculty know, like, 
for example, the more specific you are based on the actual diagnosis, the better off, better off you are in that MDM uh, chart that was distributed before the webinar. So that's, that's what I would say for residents is that time-based billing is really difficult in most scenarios. So quick question. Oh, yeah. in, in, we all work with electronic health record systems. I mean, is there a little code that you check for MDM versus time-based? In time-based, I would always document time. If you don't document time, will it just default to MDM? Um, well, I guess the auditors would look for the MDM if there's no time-based attestation. No time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're doing so, a linkage note with a resident, if it's a very complex note, and then you get the MDM coding for levels four and five. Yeah, there are some rare tools in EHRs that actually have some decision support tools that kind of okay. mock this framework. But if you don't have that, I think being, you know, being aware of the MDM subtypes, you know, level of risk, yep. number and activity of diagnoses, and the specificity of those diagnoses is important um, right. to justify that level of billing. For medical students, historically, you know, they could only really document or contribute to the fixed aspects of the chart, the review of systems or past medical and social and family history. But in 2018, I believe that changed to where they technically can contribute almost all components of note. Now, as an attending, you may not want to include their MDM uh, uh, scribbles um, with it, but you can technically do that provided that that provider is in the room with both the student and the patient reconfirming all those things. So again, just a, a quick pitch, you know, I've modeled my telehealth and student clinic at University of Colorado on this idea. Number one, I like the educational stuff. So Dr. Sacco, if you, not to say you'd be my student, but if you were on the telehealth call with me the whole time, acquiring the history, acquiring the exam, and then I don't do card flip rounds. I go right into the room virtual otherwise, mm have the student represent all these things. So theoretically, depending on your detailed workflow, you could be spending a lot of time in the room, so to speak, with that learner, uh, verifying all those facts. If that's right. the case, there's a outside chance of doing time, but still it's probably based on MDM and your re-verification of all those things. Mm -hmm. So the questions are coming in here. So oh, I know, uh, just Excuse so you know, there's some questions here. Another one is um, a lot of these time-based codes we're focusing on outpatients. Inpatient mm -hmm. coding? Are we using the same system? Hasn't or? hasn't hasn't changed. Uh, I thought patients. not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right it hasn't changed yet. much. So, okay. Yeah. My presentation at the the National Hospital Society was pretty short because there wasn't much changes for that. But I do personally think that this is almost like a pilot for what will end up being a structure for the yeah. inpatient codes as well. Yeah. People may feel differently about that, but I, I anticipate it's going to go next. Yeah. And then the what road. about with nursing nurse practitioners and PAs? That's come up now twice in the questions. Do okay. we split share visits or how do you handle that with an APP? So, so I'll start, but if someone wants to clarify, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, a lot of the APP based um, billing structures hasn't really changed. The, obviously you've got incident two billing um, or sort of isolated billing. What I'll say about split visits, if you are an attending physician with an APP, you can't double dip the time. In other words, you bill for total time, the time that the APP spent and add it to the any independent time that you might have spent in a split um, encounter, but you don't count any double up time where you're in the room with the APP and the patient. Oh, great. So I want to pivot a little bit uh, to Kathy, you know, you're a department chair, you know, what have you done to help position your faculty in dealing with all of these ambulatory changes uh, that are happening? I hope you've done a better job than I have. <laughs> You know, it's been pretty difficult. I, I mean, at a high level, we monitor the coding patterns of the faculty based on other people in the department, in their centers, and also national benchmarks. So periodically, we'll notice some coding discrepancy where somebody's like not billing as many fives as somebody else is. And then that triggers sort of kind of targeted educational modules. Our, our program director really likes teaching this, gives these lectures to residents and, and has to give them to the faculty every now and then so that you know we're on top of this. Um, our faculty um, are really interested in like case-based learning because they can really kind of see the coding um, rules in action. Um, and we found that they typically underestimate the risk element in the medical decision-making for you know, whatever reason, but that comes out. Um, this year though, we had our director of provider compliance come by and review all the changes. 
you know, did handouts, Zoom, the whole bit, recorded it. And the feedback was that everybody was confused um, and that they clearly needed more education. Um, just this week, we did some modeling of uh, some of our faculty business plans um, to kind of look at what was going to happen as we moved into these codes. So, you know, understanding that we, as, a, as the, at the academic faculty, we already built a lot of fours and fives. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of room to move. Um, so, um, and I'm going to refer to my notes here. We did two a uh, sort of uh, example faculty, one an assistant professor, one an associate professor. They both had kind of a mix of some ambulatory, some inpatient and procedural work. And if they kept their same pattern of uh, levels of codes, three, fours and fives for news and established, their total RVUs would increase about 250 to 300 per the year, which is about a RVU percentile bump of five or six percent. Yeah, that's pretty good. And that might be enough to kind of put them in a yep. little bit of a different compensation bucket. Now, the problem is, is with the reduced value of the RVU, this translates into a loss of gross charges from eight to $12,000. So uh, net revenue, it's probably somewhere between three and $5,000. So we're going to be paying the faculty more and the department's going to be getting less revenue. I, I see this as a big problem. There's going to be a problem. The hospitals are going to have to help us. But OK, we have some rapid fire questions here. Make it quick because we want one of the topics we want to cover. Brad, prolonged service codes. Any concerns or warnings? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware. You guys are seeing some of the complex patients, of course. Uh, so everyone should be aware that there's prolonged service codes currently in addition to going forward. So you've got outpatient codes, inpatient codes, and even non-face-to-face codes, specifically 99358, for instance. Um, and it's important that you document your time in your visits. Otherwise, it's going to impact your ability to code for what you need to do. Um, obviously, that 99417, that, that prolonged service code that we've got coming in is, is a godsend and making sure that you're recognizing that you can bill multiple units if you hit multiple 15 minute increments. The third thing to, to keep in mind is, is just recognizing that even if you uh, spend time in record review on a different day though than the visit, you can still get paid for that time if you hit that 30 minute mark for that one code I just mentioned. So just making sure that it's low hanging fruit, it, it's something you guys should, should certainly make sure that you're maximizing because it is revenue that is owed to you for the work that you're doing. Okay, and Pierce, you already talked a little bit about documenting if you review records and everything like that, just to document that. But Greg, what about observation day coding? Any, what's changed there? Nothing yet, but it's on the docket as our okay. ER codes. And uh, then probably after that will be the inpatient codes. Uh, yeah. There's an attempt to uh, the revive codes. the consultation codes, but remember this a uh, new coding scheme only applies to outpatient codes for new and established patients for 2021 right. and also for the video codes because that structure has already been incorporated for the video visits. But all other situations, you have to use the old bullet point method to calculate your patient and use the greater than 50% uh, counseling and coordination of care if you're using time. And um, so we touched on consultation codes and Pierce, any, any different ways that certain subspecialties or divisions have changed um, more than others, uh, particularly when it's times to documenting the assessment or medical decision-making, any, any, any ideas there? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I'm not telling the chairs anything new here that, you know, or being a practice administrator for a neurology department is like being the administrator for several different departments. So I do think that like with a lot of other things, you have to treat these subspecialties as almost wholly different animals. Um, and so, so you know, the, the amount of exam documentation that I do in the epilepsy division is gonna be very different than what's required out of neuromuscular. So I, you know, the, the short answer is yes, they should be treated very differently. And then last question in this section, Jasmine, workflow adjustments. You know, we all have worked on templates and workflows and structures. Have you made some changes uh, based on these e &M changes? Not yet, but we're looking at, at what changes we might need to make, not only in our documentation templates, but even our scheduling templates to um, maximize the benefits of these changes. 
Yep. I mean, because if we go to um, medical decision making, it's possible even in 30 minutes to have a complex patient, right? I mean, depending on how you document. So uh, as opposed to what we normally think of as one hour for a new patient, you know, it's kind of a mixture between how complex it is and then let alone time. So great discussion, a lot of resources that we have available at the AAN. Uh, I think this whole uh, idea of case-based approach that, that Kathy mentioned is another way to help educate your faculty to deal with these changes, as well as continuing to, continuing to monitor and improve quality. We're gonna to pivot to the third topic. Um, and it is a topic that we have addressed in the past because uh, telemedicine has really been you know, a savior for a lot of neurology. I know in my own department, we've gone to pretty quickly to virtual neurology, especially when we were closed down to quite a bit. Uh, and as you know, most of you know, uh, the carriers were reimbursing and you're gonna go over this a little bit. We wanna hear from Kathy Sila first about how telemedicine was integrated in her department, how much of it is still going on on outpatient, maybe some of it's changed over time with the uh, peaks in COVID-19, but just some thoughts on how telemedicine is being incorporated into everyday academic ambulatory work. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, prior to COVID, we had a uh, rural and critical access telemedicine mm. clinic that started out as general neurology, but rapidly developed a sleep subspecialty clinic. And we were working on the criteria for what was appropriate for office, what could be done virtual for all the other subspecialties. So people were thinking about this. Then COVID hit, and we really had to launch into those criteria, which we've been continuously refining, but we've struggled to try to implement those criteria at a central scheduling level. So when a patient calls, um, they would be directed, oh, you could do virtual or no, you know, you really need to be seen in the office without somebody who's a content expert. Um, so I think we need to figure that out. Uh, right now, we're sort of letting the patient choose. Mm -hmm. And that's if it's true. appropriate for virtual, then that's fine. And if we feel that we can't address the issue adequately, then we set up a, a follow-up appointment after that. And we're still leveraging multiple platforms. We overwhelmed our existing telemedicine systems uh, using a wide range, probably the same things that you know everybody else is using, just to try to get the job done. And then in this table you have up here, different carriers reimburse in different ways, phone as well as virtual. Virtual is always better. But um, what can you tell us about this? And we're going to talk to Amanda in a moment to say, are these reimbursement policies going to stay or not? But what, what can you tell us here about, at least in Ohio? So I'm very envious of people who work at places like my husband, uh, where he has no idea what I'm talking about when I show him this grid, uh, because you know the billing people do it on the back end. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't. I, I mean, so we. I have this sort of cheat sheet grid, it's for Ohio payers, but it really illustrates the, the various um, criteria and rules that they all have and what they'll allow you to bill. Now, if you don't bill it right the first time and the coding people have to fix it on the back end, then that just delays all the right. reimbursement and you run the risk of a denial. So, you know, I, I highlighted here Ohio Medicaid, which I think really has been, has kind of stepped up to the plate. Um, they allow virtual visits at parity um, for new consults and established. They'll allow you to do that by phone as well because they understand that their socioeconomically disadvantaged people don't really have the technology required to do some of these visits. And they will also accept some of the other telephone only and um, portal based um, codes. But some of the other payers, you know, not so, um, you know, uh, flexible. Um, and so you do need to know this up front as to whether you're going to drop a consult code for a payer that's not going to pay for a consult. Um, and then the documentation is different. Great. Yeah, these little cheat sheets are helpful. We have to, at our place, also have to put in our own code uh, at the end of the Epic Encounter, whether it's in person, virtual, uh, telephone, or virtual. But virtual, I still think, is the better way to go. Amanda, 
we're all hoping, and I know the AAN is, we're advocating strong here. We did it before COVID, we're doing it now during COVID and after COVID to keep the reimbursement going. What can you tell us about the crystal ball and reimbursement for telemedicine? Sure. So the federal government you know, currently has done a lot to expand access to telehealth, and we hope to find out in the next week with some final regulations that should be coming out with what they are able to do beyond the current public health emergency. Um, access and payment rates, you know, I think that we expect the incoming administration to also be very pro telehealth. Um, I think the biggest question for me is probably the rate that phone payment, that phone codes will be oh, paid. Right. If, you know, I don't know if it's realistic to expect that we continue to be paid at the same rate as, you know, a full video virtual visit. Um, but, you know, we're, we're interacting with private payers, reaching out to them, advocating at all levels across Medicare and private payers. So we'll definitely keep our members posted. But there's a lot of there are a lot of good signs about um, expanded access to telehealth beyond right. the current. Situation. And this was something that we fought for before COVID to move from not just rural to move it to a further reimbursement. And then obviously COVID accelerated it all for payment and ambulatory. You know, it is differential too. You know, for example, in our group, our Alzheimer's and, and, and migraine patients were made a quick switch. You know, think about how you can, you know, take a history over the phone uh, and get uh, most of your work done on the uh, medical decision-making for Alzheimer's and, and especially when family members are there and migraine. Our neuromuscular had trouble. You know, they have to examine uh, muscles and nerves and it gets a little harder to do that. So they had a little bit more difficulty when it came to switching uh, to virtual. Um, but, you know, it, it has been, I think, an important uh, way that we can continue access to our patients. Pierce, what about state changes? I know this, we have also been trying to advocate about cross state um, practicing uh, patterns that telemedicine has permitted, but any any state differential issues that could come up with telemedicine? Oh, yeah, current and future. Um, you know, I think in the public health emergency, HSS kind of released the federal aspect of that, um, but really it was up to states in terms of reciprocation and parity. So there's the parity aspect. There's also the licensure, you know, agreements. Like, can you get licensure if your patient is, for us, in, over the state lines in Wyoming, for example. Um, is really differs from state to state. And then additional layers, also the malpractice uh, coverage and liability issues. And so it is an ever-changing um, uh, thing. I know that like, for example, so I won't pick on certain states, but certain states are very egregious in terms of their requirements and or their fees. Um, and then other states are not. So it really is, you, you have to work closely with your with your department administrators to, to understand that. Because there are incidences where you find out at the point of the encounter, you're doing telehealth and your patients in Oklahoma on, on ill-advised vacation um, and, uh, and, and you can't bill for that. And, and so you, you had to sort of uh, do it either as charity or, or sort of uh, reschedule the visit. And, you know, like I said, certain things have been relaxed, but, you know, it will change again. And these, um, you know, interest rate or interstate uh, compacts were an issue. I know the AAN in the past had advocated to kind of reduce some of those as barriers to improve telemedicine and access, but um, it's still not clear where, where that's all going. Um, what about, um, you know, the AAN other resources? Luana, uh, what can you tell us about some more information that the AAN can provide? And I know we've done a lot of work, Brad, and the committee has had other webinars on telemedicine in, in specifically. Yep. So we do have the telemedicine implementation guide. This was put together early on in the year um, at the onset of the pandemic with coding guidance and practice solutions and how to set up and technology and you know what software is acceptable and whatnot and HIPAA compliant. So we do have that. Uh, I'll reiterate again the practice inbox. That's something any practice related or coding question you can reach out to staff to respond to. Um, the slide set will be circulated afterwards and that has the web pages listed where we have to cover all the topics today. We have the EEG FAQ documents. We have those case studies for EM um, to walk through a typical patient to really understand the medical decision making that Dr. Klein was referring to. Um, we have some brief recorded webinars. So, so a lot of things you can access online and, and always reach staff directly too. Great. And then with telemedicine also, um, I know we talked about with e and codes, you know, our residents, our fellows, our APPs are involved in telemedicine. 
Um, what, what have you done there? Uh, who wants to try to take, tackle that in terms of using telemedicine uh, with, uh, say, a, a faculty member and a trainee? Pierce, do you want to tackle that one or Kathy? Sure. Yeah, no, uh, that's fine. Um, similar idea. We try to actually mimic somewhat that structure of staffing patients. I think the thing is, is that we fortunately have a platform that's fairly turnkey and the ability to sort of join the virtual room. So it's, it's right. much like you would in a physical clinic where I'm going from that room to staff this patient and this room to staff another patient. Um, so, so not much has changed for me for the resident side of things. I don't know how other people. Yeah, we have Epic and Epic has works with Zoom and the resident or fellow can be in there and then you can, they can come out, talk to the faculty member, and then you can go back in together. So it worked pretty well. Kathy, any thoughts with you on that, on that regard? Yeah, ours, ours has been a struggle, mostly because yeah. we don't have a good central platform. So um, some of our virtual visits are uh, actually like in a workroom with a couple of individuals and an attending going around so that they can actually for once, staff multiple cases at the same time hmm. um, because they're actually seeing all the screens. So it's it's sort of like intraoperative monitoring or something. Um, but but it's not I, you know we it, our experience has not been as good as many others. And Greg, how about you at Henry Ford? We have had excellent success with uh, using this for when we were socially distancing for reading EEGs because we just uh, pulled up a uh, Zoom or Skype session and everybody looked at the same shared oh, screen. Same and so actually, I think it was actually an enhanced reading because everybody had to look at the same screen at the same time. And uh, so there are ways that some of this has been advantageous right. to teaching. I will say the other thing telemedicine has done for us is we've had very low no-show rates. We had late cancellation and no-show rates. In, in South Florida, we're at 25%, where you couldn't fill that slot because they wouldn't show up the last minute. Our no-show rates and late cancellations have really ratcheted down. So at least we're improving efficiency with the people showing up for their virtual visit. Great discussion, three important topics. EEG coding here and how do we navigate it? Thank you for all of your input on that. E&M coding, there could be some upside down to upside to all this in, in terms of how to do it through medical decision making and obviously total time. And then telemedicine, something that I think we all are really happy that uh, neurology was able to pivot uh, pretty rapidly into telemedicine. I think it really has helped at least continue a lot of revenue streams for some of our academic departments. I think you'll hear some in terms of strategic planning, division directors, uh, faculty compensation plans. These are some of the upcoming webinars that we're working, I want, working on right now to come over the next few months. I wanna thank my panelists for a really great discussion, some real experts here, and of course the Academy of Neurology for helping us uh, maneuver through all of these uh, changes. Stay well, stay safe, have a happy Thanksgiving and keep it quieter and smaller. Thank you, everyone. Take care.